Good afternoon, everybody. This is Steve Capon with Training Pros. I want to welcome everybody to our inaugural Learning Views webinar series sponsored by Training Pros and Harrisburg University. Again, my name is Steve Capon. I am the president of Training Pros, and I'm going to uh, just give a little overview before we hand over the microphone to our partners with uh, Harrisburg University. Um, I'm hoping that everybody walks away from today's session better prepared to present a business case, to create game-based or simulation-based learning programs, and to start implementing these learning strategies, or to pursue educational uh, and certification opportunities in the learning development field that will allow you, possibly as a consultant, to develop these types of solutions for your clients or your organization. A bit about our partnership. Uh, Training Pros and Harrisburg University are partnering on the Learning Views webinar series because we want to share some of the latest developments that Training Pros and Harrisburg University is observing in the marketplace and to demonstrate how Harrisburg University can provide a master's level program to professionals who want, to, who want or need to pursue an advanced degree in the learning technology space. Training Pros is a leading provider of contract learning and development talent in the U.S. We work with organizations that need to design, develop, and deliver learning solutions to their organizations when they do not have the internal capacity or expertise. Uh, so we provide instructional designers, technical communicators, e-learning developers, trainers, facilitators, and OD consultants to our clients. Um, and our clients work with local relationship managers who are experts in the learning and development industry themselves to get the type of talent they need to deliver on these programs. Um, Harrisburg University translates the latest developments in learning technologies into a master's program for professionals who are responsible for building skills and capabilities in corporate organizations. Um, Harrisburg University provides students with leading edge approaches and skills to help them apply existing and emerging learning technologies in a variety of learning environments. Now about our program. Um, we have seen an increased interest with clients and in the learning and development industry in general in immersive learning through games, gamification, simulations that we believe to a great extent are in response to a generation of learners who are entering the workforce who require a different approach to learning, as well as a continued effort to increase the overall efficacy of adult learning. Games and game mechanics provide opportunities to focus on exploring and doing instead of listening. It can be a big leap for trainers and instructional designers to move toward using games and designing game-based learning. So we believe that this session will give you a better understanding of how these learning strategies can transform the learning solutions that you're delivering to your organizations. Now I want to introduce you to Andy Petrosky. He's the Director and Assistant Professor of Learning Technologies at Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. Andy coordinates the Learning Technologies Master of Science program and teaches courses in serious game design, gamification, advanced instructional design, and online learning. So I now want to welcome Andy Petrosky to the session and give him the reins, and I'm going to sit back and enjoy. Hope everybody enjoys this program. Take care. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that introduction and overview of our partnership. We're really looking forward to getting this uh, series kicked off with today's session. And it's great to see um, so uh, much participation and attendance from, uh, from throughout the U.S. I saw a good day there from Nancy, so we may have a, an international representation as well, I'm guessing Australia or maybe uh, Nancy's just back from a, a trip from there. Uh, anyway, in addition to uh, coordinating and teaching in the Learning Technologies Master of Science program at Harrisburg University, I also work with the faculty at the university to help them integrate technology, including games, into their courses. I also work on game simulation and virtual world projects with clients through our Center for Advanced Entertainment and Learning Technologies. So game simulations, immersive learning, gamification is a big part of uh, what I've been doing at Harrisburg University over the past six years, and I'm excited to share some of that, um, some of that with you, uh, with you today. Um, so, um, with that in mind, let's uh, get started here. Actually, before we do, one thing I wanted to mention was um, the uh, Q and A panel that has appeared on the left side of the screen, just under the participants or attendees list. That's a space for you, um, in addition to the chat, to enter questions throughout the, today's session. I encourage you to uh, offer comments and questions in the text chat. 
uh, throughout our, our conversation and, and our discussion today. Uh, the Q&A is for more detailed questions, more in-depth questions than you might want to type in the text chat. We're also going to probably be getting up towards 100 participants in the room today, and the text chat may be uh, rolling by uh, pretty quickly. So if there's a question you want to make sure it doesn't get lost in the, in the uh, text chat, um, please type that in the, in the Q&A. We asked uh, everyone who registered to note the reason for attending the webinar when, when registering. Uh, this word cloud is a representation of the types of answers that were provided by the 190 plus people that registered for this webinar. Overall, everyone was looking for or is looking for new ideas and techniques uh, to enhance their current training program primarily. And most everyone is looking for a general overview and insights into gamification and games. So uh, that's what we're going to, uh, to focus on today. Uh, is an overview and introductory insights into games, simulations, and gamification, uh, as uh, well as taking a look at what types of options are available, what might be a good fit for you uh, in your organization, and the topics that you're trying to address with training. Uh, we'll also look at a couple of uh, specific examples. Uh, we'll identify some of the benefits of the game-based training approach, and Steve has already touched on a few of those already. Uh, we'll we'll uh, go a little bit more in depth with those and talk about considerations as you begin to use game-based learning or pursue uh, that type of, uh, of learning or training approach. We'll start off with uh, some definitions actually with a focus on differentiating gamification and games and simulations. And we won't take a, a long time on this, um, but really, really um, kind of addressing the hype uh, around the term gamification. And there is a lot of hype and, and um, conversation and, and noise around the term gamification. Uh, to set the context of what we're going to talk about today, I'd like to explore uh, some of that terminology just briefly. Uh, about three years ago, immersive learning, and that was the term that Steve uh, used as well in his introduction, was a term that was being used uh, to describe highly contextual and problem-based learning activities. Immersive learning encompassed activities, games, serious games, simulation, alternate reality games. Uh, it was the term used because of one of one of the big issues in using game-based strategies in business was the term game itself. No one liked the term, and business, businesses and business leaders responded with an uninformed, we don't want our employees having uh, fun and playing games. Learning isn't supposed to be fun. That was my best boss man voice there. I apologize for, I haven't had acting lessons, so apologize for that. Uh, but that was kind of the response was, you know, game immediately shut down, immediately no way we're going to do that. We're a serious financial company. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're not playing games here. Uh, the eLearning Guild published reports on immersive learning in 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, my friend and colleague Kareen Olbrich Pagano wrote a book on immersive learning last year. Uh, then about uh, two or three years ago, this magical word gamification came along. Uh, gamification is a related but entirely different concept than immersive learning. Uh, immersive learning was always about training and performance improvement. Gamification is about behavior modification. Now, that can be related to performance improvement in the workplace, but it also applies to marketing and purchasing, health behaviors, personal finance, and good citizenship, and really, you know, a, a variety of other behavioral areas and, and, and categories. Uh, not just training and performance development in, in the workplace. Uh, immersive learning was always a training or education term. Of the few that understood immersive learning, it was mainly a term for instructional designers and instructional technologists. Uh, gamification, on the other hand, has received a lot of press and been very visible across many industries and disciplines, and as a result, has become more of a societal term. And like the Kleenex brand, gamification has become the term applied to anything having to do with games. So I didn't want to take too much time with that definition, um, but wanted to set some context for today. Uh, so gamification has won the terminology battle. And congratulations, gamification. I love gamification. Uh, and, and while the term has become generic and, and lost some of its original meaning, it's great that there is a term for us that executive and managers um, and, and manager levels can be comfortable with and that people understand to some extent. Uh, so you can call it what you like, but for me, old habits are, are a little hard to break in this realm. Uh, so I'm probably going to be referring to what we're talking about today primarily as immersive learning or games, serious games or simulations. And these are, you know, differentiated by me as things that are 
purpose, purposely part of a defined learning experience versus gamification, which again is, is much broader. Uh, so I've highlighted some of the things within the broader gamification umbrella that we're going to primarily talk about today. So now it's your turn. Um, regardless of what you want to call it or what you can call it, and again, um, you know, even though uh, it's not the original meaning, gamification, if it's what your, your boss or your employees or your organization is going to accept as a way to do these types of, uh, to take these types of approaches to training, um, what are some reasons for the increased interest in these types of learning solutions? Why should you or why are you considering games as training? And if you can type that in the text chat, uh, we'll just uh, take a moment and gather some feedback from, from everyone who's attending here today and get a sense of, of what you're looking for from this new uh, So engagement, uh, generational issues, uh, quickly training, hands-on learning, learning that sticks, retention of information, fun. I see a lot of generational, okay, self-directed, young kids need their games. <laughs> uh, we, we all play games. We all need our games. Uh, coaching, mobile. different but exciting way to an seemingly boring subject. OK. And that's normally the, the types of reasons or the, the, you know, the reasons that um, you know, people are looking at um, games, uh, gamification, um, immersive learning. And um, one of the reasons they're originally you know, drawn to it is just something different, juicing up dry topics. Uh, as Amy has uh, Amy's ha has referenced there. Now there were a number of you who also listed you know listed engagement, more hands-on learning, um, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit now. Uh, in most cases, a lot of the learning produced is about listening, or in the case of e-learning, reading and clicking. Uh, designers often integrate activities into online learning, but it often is a glorified test question, no matter what kind of package or wrapper it in wrapper that it's in. Uh, and those types of experiences don't really engage the mind as much as they do the mouse. Uh, as designers, we need to create experiences that engage learners in their head and not just in their index finger. Games and simulations are those experiences where learners have to analyze, interpret, make decisions, uh, and or reflect. So some of the you know, ancillary or environmental reasons uh, as far as you know, younger generations, juicing up dry topics, um, those are good reasons to move to games and immersive learning, but they're not great reasons like hands-on learning, like sticky training, like applications of the workforce, like putting people in contextual uh, situations. This is just a, another way of visualizing what I was just describing. Uh, too often training is driven by information, uh, so we have our info screen, info screen, info screen, quiz, and then you know the variation on that is info, info, activity, info, quiz. Uh, and um, versus that, we want to look at moving to practicing how to apply knowledge and skills within the context of solving problems and using information as a way of supporting decision making, not necessarily the, the core of the learning experience. Here are some specific game attributes that are particularly useful for learning. Uh, motivation and goal orientation after failure and cues, hints, and assistance to keep uh, learners progressing is similar to the theory of zone of proximal development and scaffolding. Uh, Julie Dirksen in her book, Design for How People Learn, refers to the cycles of expertise. Uh, and flow theory is another concept that focuses on the need to provide people with enough challenge that they don't get bored, but not too much challenge so, so that they don't get frustrated. And if you think of a lot of traditional learning design, it is very um, you know, geared towards the middle and is kind of an upward ramp uh, or an upward uh, slope the entire experience. We just keep putting on more and more and more and more information without giving people a chance to practice. And again, games can create environments where um, that type of experience can be enhanced through contextual learning and problem-based learning. Uh, these are some of the elements that are core to a game experience, but it's not as easy as just slapping on a score uh, to your e-learning interface. There are a lot of considerations to make a game that is balanced, has the right mix of game mechanics to meet the learning goals, and is still a fun experience for the learner. 
uh, take a moment and consider if any of these elements are currently present in your traditional training approaches, or if they're not, how they could be. If you want to share your thoughts in the text chat, you can do so, but at least think to yourself how your current training programs could be improved by some of these elements. And I'll just give you a moment to, to And so stories are included in, in training currently. Yes, yeah, storytelling is a, is a big um, focus in um, e-learning design or training design and the power of stories to engage and also to transfer. Yeah, I would say, Patricia, feedback is probably the one element that is in everyone's um, you know, training or e-learning. Um, how rich that feedback is, you know, probably varies um, from uh, from uh, solution to solution, designer to designer, company to company. Uh, but you know, feedback is definitely core. And as you look at these, um, at, as you look at these elements, and you're doing, you know, one or another, or feedback is something that you are doing and you're doing it well. You know, maybe look at that as a way, as a platform, or as a as a kind of a springboard into incorporating some of these other elements. So, what can you do um, that will build off of what you're already doing uh, well or, or have a strength in. Great. Thank you guys for contributing in the, in the text chat there. So Alicia, you have a question in the Q&A about uh, examples of gamification in the effective domain. And actually, probably the majority, uh, well, yeah, I would say the majority of gamification applications have an effective domain element because it is focused on behavior change, which is primarily an attitudinal um, you know, um, change. Uh, and so um, you know, I think a lot of the things that you see in, in um, in health behavior um, are um, in the effective domain. Uh, you know, um, I think uh, fin you know finances to some extent. Um, also, collaboration um, among you know among um, individuals within a group working already, or kind of individuals who have never worked together before. You know, creating that collaboration. Uh, I think those are some some common things that I've seen in a lot of gamification. Um, that is, you know, focused on effective. But again, it, that's almost in every gamification application because you you really are, um, you know, focused on changing. It's on motivation, you know, changing motivation, enhancing motivation, changing behavior, and and changing attitude. And uh, we have one example here that I have queued up that we may have a chance to take a look at. And I have resources that will take you out to some other gamification and game and immersive learning examples uh, towards the end of today's session as well. So what can these types of learning experiences look like? Uh, these are some categories that may help to differentiate, differentiate the types of experiences that are possible. Uh, take a moment and read through the bullet list descriptions for each. There's like four or five. I'm not going to read to you today. You can see those on screen. Uh, type any questions you have about any of those in the text chat. As you study these, keep in mind, like most categorization, there are blurred lines between the categories, and no one experience will fit perfectly into one category or another. Uh, rather, the categories are a way to show a spectrum of, of possible experiences. And Shauna and Kathleen, you know, I think you're you're right about the client and educating the client, and that's where some of the the terminology, um, you know, was originally in in the way. Again, that term game tend to um, tend to to, uh, to turn people off. So I think you can build uh, the benefits of games into um, you know into learning experiences without having to call them games. You know, there's really that focused on a on a problem based approach. Uh, is something that can be an initial focus, or again, using that feedback component as a jumping off point for integrating some um, problem-based uh, strategies or, or game-based strategies. 
disconnected themes is um, in serious games so that the, the themes are not necessarily um, completely contextual. So if I'm learning leadership, I may be in a Star Trek themed game. That's an example of disconnected themes. So, you know, I'm obviously not training to be a Starship um, fleet leader. Um, I watched too much Big Bang Theory, so that was the first thing that came to mind there. Um, <laughs> or, but I'm training on leadership or management in that uh, game. Uh, Helena, a single player game is just uh, it's just me and the game playing. I'm not competing against uh, anyone in the game, or I may not even be um, competing against anyone on a scoreboard. It's just me in the game by myself would be single player. I just want to check some of the Q&A here. Uh, so, Larry, uh, in addition to disconnected themes, you had a question about variable driven. So, um, oftentimes in a serious game, at least in that kind of, you know, if I'm fitting into that box, um, I'm making a decision in the game, and then based on that decision, um, vari the variables kind of play out. So, I'm not necessarily involved, and, and it may be um, time warped, so I may make a decision and then it fast forwards to two weeks later. Um, this is what has happened based on that decision you, you've made. Whereas experience driven simulations are much more time, uh, I guess I would call it time accurate or time appropriate, and that I make a decision and then I see immediately, you know, how the person immediately responded to my decision um, versus, you know, maybe a time lapse type of approach. Uh, TJ, um, I do have. I don't have any examples, but I can tell you of an example. Um, there was actually uh, probably more of a multiplayer um, simulation that um, was a. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the the department, um, but it was a government agency um, that created a management simulation that actually. Um, everyone did in a classroom together, and they all played different roles in the simulation, and they were playing the simulation uh, and playing off of each other's gameplay in that simulation all in the same uh, classroom. And I, I just, you know, just, I can't remember the specifics of that. I remember it was a management simulation, and it was, um, I think it was DAU, it was Defense Acquisition University, that did that, yeah. And Carol, I'm going to come back to your question about um, MMOs or, or answer that separately. And uh, James, can can the two be used in the same simulation? Is your question? And I guess um, I think you're I'm guessing you're referring to single player and multiplayer. Um, and if that's the case, yeah, um, it certainly could be. You know, you would want to have a goal and a vision for that and a reason for doing so. But um, you know, from a game design standpoint or a um, you know, developmental uh, development standpoint, um, that uh, that that certainly could be done. So thank you guys for um, and John. Yes, there are definitely classic management and especially project management board games that are multiplayer. So thank you guys for participating in the text chat. I'm going to try to get to all of those um, or you know as much as I can there. And Janice will get to software and technology a little in a little bit uh, as well. All right. And same, same uh, Carol, with your question. All right. So I think I'm getting to most of those there. Great. So just want to kind of run down through um, some of the more detailed examples of what these uh, types of games are. So this is a screen capture of a crossword game. Uh, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune are other common themes to simple games in corporate learning. Uh, these are used quite a bit because there are a lot of existing game te uh, templates. They're fairly easy to create, easy to implement. They're very simple to play. People know how to play them. Uh, and the content, for the most part, can be easily changed. However, these are really focused on you know, memorization and identification and are really, if you're thinking about Bloom's taxonomy, at the lower levels of understanding and remembering. And if I had a big red X and I, I should have probably um, animated one on the screen here, I would cross it across the screen and say these are not the types of things that we're really striving for or really going to focus on uh, today. So I'll move on from there. And, and really, again, I think it's because of um, a focus on uh, that contextual learning, applied learning, experiential learning, and, and um, you know, 
people making contextual decisions that they're going to be making in the workplace, you know, within the training um, or game or simulation. Uh, these are screen captures from Dow AgroSciences Serious Game for Sales Reps that mirrors the real world context of their jobs, achieving sales goals. Uh, sales reps needed to understand the effect that formulation type has on product performance in order to make an appropriate product recommendation to their customers, um, address product challenges, and answer customer questions. Uh, what makes this a serious game versus a simulation is the controlled progress in the game. If you see, uh, there there are you know areas here that are that are locked out, so it's very controlled, um, um, you know, progress or or kind of exploration in the game versus you know maybe being able to explore um, individually or on my at my own pace. Uh, the fact that you play as a character in the game yourself. So uh, here is. Uh, you're playing as the character uh, Raul, uh, and uh, versus uh, versus yourself in this game, uh, and, and so you take on a character role versus in a simulation playing the role of yourself. And then the graphical treatment makes it a little less, you know, a little less realistic as as well. So this is probably, you know, again best labeled as a as a um, as a serious game, but certainly has elements of simulation. Uh, Serious games are usually very targeted uh, and often referred to even as mini games. They're very multimodal. You can see all of the things that you're having to think about and make decisions uh, about and monitor here as well. Uh, they're often character driven, and I mentioned that uh, as part of uh, the reason why this is a serious game. And uh, the experience can be different every time, however. Now, in this uh, scenario, uh, the progress is the same, but based on the decisions I make, I, I may be able to have a different experience each time. Uh, these games are a little bit, you know, are more difficult to create than, than simple games. Uh, oftentimes, difficult to customize the experience. It's a um, confined environment uh, to some extent, maybe more than simulation in that I'm really, um, all of my interactions are kind of pre-programmed there. Uh, and any multiplayer activity in most serious games is often is often competition. Okay, so I'm going to just check the the text chat here, and also the Q and A, and see where we are. And so there's a reference, uh, Shauna and, and Donna, about um, cost and um, looking for a less time and cost intensive way. And I will address that. Uh, not specifically, but generally I will address that. And I think that is a common misconception of these types of experiences, that they are costly and take a lot of time to, uh, to develop. Some of them do, but, but they don't have to. And thanks, Russ, for um, sharing that, uh, that resource uh, from acceleration. Um, a branching scenario would either be a serious game or a simulation, Shauna, uh, based, uh, I'm referring to your question in the, in the Q&A. And then there's simulations or simulated environments. Um, these screens, uh, the captures on screen that are an example, are a negotiation simulation that's from uh, the company NextLearn, which has a simulation development tool called SimWriter. Um, I have no affiliation to them uh, or, and, or the product, um, but certainly want to give them credit for um, the work they've done with uh, simulations and that product as well. And then uh, the one below that is actually a virtual world simulation that's a first responder simulation in, in an open world or a, a virtual world called OpenSim. So, Simulated environments provide more open experiences. They're very environment intensive. You can see how important and how you know, realistic the environments are in these two simulations. You have a lot of that same multimodal interaction. Uh, in the case of the first responder simulation, there's a lot of collaboration. Uh, these obviously are a little bit more difficult to create if you're going if we're going up the scale here. They also take a little bit more time to play, including an orientation to the space uh, versus serious or, or simple games. And oftentimes the play or the interaction needs to happen over multiple sessions. So it's oftentimes difficult um, to sit down and do a simulation uh, in one sitting because they are usually very uh, deep in decision making. Now that doesn't mean that they are. Um, you know, have to be, or that they're 
always more expensive, uh, but uh, certainly something that's uh, common across them and something to consider. The uh, serious games, when we look at Bloom's taxonomy, are kind of moving up that level, the levels of Bloom's a little bit, into applying and analyzing primarily. And simulations are, are about evaluating uh, and creating. And obviously, analysis is a big um, part of that as well. So with that in mind, um, let me drag the uh, a poll out onto the screen here. And I want to get some feedback on, from you guys on the types of immersive learning that you've previously used in your training programs. And if you haven't used any, um, certainly you can indicate that as well. And while you're doing that, I'm going to catch up on the text chat and make sure I'm addressing And I see the I see the, some of the comments about articulate and captivate and storyline, and I'm I'm going to come back to those a little bit. Um, Catherine, the um, chat is part of the recording, so you will have access to that as well. All right, so thank you guys for participating in that um, poll. I want to just want to share uh, those results here. So, you know, as is common, a lot of folks are using those simple games and. Um, you know, fewer doing serious games and simulated environments, uh, branching uh, decision making trees, branching scenarios are certainly part of the simulated environments. So there are more people that are doing those than serious games, which require a theme and characters and a little bit more of design effort as well as, um, in some cases, development effort as well. So those results aren't surprising. And then um, hopefully, you know, the folks that are joining today that have not used any of these types of experiences for training, you know, one of the things I would encourage is that you not feel that you have to start at the bottom, if you will, with simple games. Uh, really, you want to strategize and, um, you know, optimize your efforts in these areas uh, so that you're using the best solutions uh, that fit your environment and, and your needs. And, and simple games may actually um, hurt your efforts in doing more immersive learning uh, than they would than they would help and, and may kind of um, you know give uh, the learners a lowered expectation of, of what gaming and simulation and immersive learning uh, could be like. So thank you guys for participating in that poll and continued participation in the uh, in the text chat here. So today's session really isn't really formatted for us to take an in-depth look at game examples. We could probably take an hour just to examine a single experience, but I'd like to provide a little bit better sense of what a game-based experience can be and some examples of those. Uh, the examples I'm going to show are all projects that I've been involved with in some way. Uh, many of them are through my work at Harrisburg University with our Center for Advanced Entertainment and Learning Technologies. Uh, later, I'll also share some resources for you in other game and simulation examples. Uh, that's one thing that has changed um, dramatically over the last you know, five years. I mean, people have been creating really great immersive, sim uh, immersive learning experiences for 10, 15, 20 years now. Um, but examples of those um, were really hard to come by. And that's no longer the case. There are a lot of examples, a lot of free games out there to play. Uh, that um, give a good representation of what these types of experiences uh, can be. So these are our choices for examples today. And I'll give you guys a chance to take a look at those. And then I'm going to bring a poll, a poll out onto the screen that will give you a chance to choose um, three of the examples that you may want to take a look at. And um, we'll try to take a look at three. We may only have time to, uh, to look at, at two. All right, so I'm going to take this out onto the screen here. I'm going to try to give you guys as much room to continue to uh, view the descriptions as I can. And um, Christine, in addition to discussing gamification, uh, cover using gamification to encourage engagement through an entire curriculum, training plan with multiple learning events. So 
Um, I will talk about that briefly towards the end, um, but that won't be, be a focus of, of today's session. Uh, again, today really focusing more on the learning events themselves and games and simulations as part of um, those, those learning, learning solutions as that learning event. Uh, the gamification from the standpoint of um, you know, motivation, behavior change, attitudinal change is something I'll, I'll address and touch on at the end, but we won't get into that uh, in, in any great depth. <clears throat> All right, so we have most of our results in here. So let's see. Um, we have technology manager si uh, simulation. Meeting etiquette. and information literacy and if we have chance if we have chance to get to information literacy I'm not going to uh, I'm actually going to go to a, another one I believe and that's the legal issues looks like it is the next one cuz the information literacy I don't have a really good demo of that I can give you a, a general overview of it but not a real good demo um so, with that in mind, let's take a look at the technology manager uh, simulation. And I'm actually going to need to share my screen to do that. So we're going to move to a little bit of a different layout. And you should have a um, screen coming up in just a second here. And uh, give that a moment. And Justin, if you can confirm that um, I'm sharing my screen and have the IT manager simulation up. Great, thank you. And so this is the IT manager simulation. And this actually will, will right away hit the point that these solutions do not have to be um, large scale or expensive and probably are more, um, this example is more in line with the branching simulation that uh, was being referred to earlier. Uh, so um, we run a government uh, technology institute here at Harrisburg University, and as part of the institute, have IT manager train uh, an IT manager certificate, a government IT manager manager certificate that we offer um, primarily, you know, being based in Pennsylvania to um, agencies, government agencies in Pennsylvania. So as part of this training. Um, these uh, students, the, the learners, come into the classroom. Um, two days um, each month and uh, around that classroom training is um, built this IT manager simulation. Uh, so Jackie, thank you for reminding me about that. You can actually go, um, you should be able to go full screen yourself. Um, there is a crosshairs button at the top right of the um, sharing area and if you click that you should be able to manage your own full screen. I'd rather you do that than um, have me go full screen for everyone. And um, if you toggle that button again, you can come back to the, uh, the main presentation area. And once you go full screen, um, the menu will go away. Um, you'll just need to move your cursor up to the top of the screen to bring the menu back, and then you can toggle back to this screen. So thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, and a lot of these demos, you may want to go full screen. So I am just going to click into one of these um, examples here. So uh, I'm sorry. Let me finish the kind of background there. Uh, so they come into the classroom, and as part of the classroom, or to augment the classroom, um, they do they uh, take part in the simulation. And the simulation actually is applied in a number of different ways. In some cases, they do the simulation before they come into the classroom and focus on the topic. In some cases, they do the simulation after they're in the classroom and get an introduction to the topic. And in some cases, they conclude the classroom session by actually doing the simulation um, in the classroom as a group. And they'll actually, um, to make decisions in the simulation, they'll actually get the participants up and out of their chairs and say, OK, for those of you that want to let, um, option A, go to this side of the room. For those of you that want option B, go to this side of the room. So I'll just click into one of these uh, simulations here. And uh, you know, you'll see it's pretty pretty basic from the standpoint of any type of graphic design or even interaction design. We're actually using 
a built-in um, lesson tool in Moodle, which is a course management system um, primarily for you know higher ed and, and K through 12 that we use here at the university for our um, credit courses or our university courses, and we're using it for this program as well. And you can see that it essentially is again being presented with a scenario and some options. And in this case, um, the technology management often is around um, communication and some decision making on chains of command and how to engage and involve people and um, is not necessarily about um, technology. In this scenario or simulation, uh, we're actually asking them to create a statement of work. And so they're, they're navigating the um, various departments and who, who to include in that conversation and who to, um, how to communicate around awarding a contract. Um, so in these simulations, they're very simple branching simulations that just go two levels deep. And then we branch off into another area of the simulation. So this is something um, that I think really uh, hits to the core that these things do not have to be really high end um, and high production, uh, but still reap the benefits of moving beyond that information as training approach. And uh, you know, this is material that um, previously you know would have been presented in a lecture format um, with a PowerPoint um, and you know um, something that the folks probably have already seen or heard uh, in that format probably 30 times by the time they get to this point of their career um, being an IT manager and what they really need are challenges to um, you know practice making tough decisions and practice seeing the overall picture and, and practice in, in communicating and making uh, communication decisions. So that is the government IT manager uh, simulation or the tech manager simulation. Uh, the next one I want to go to is uh, meeting etiquette. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for this one. So certainly, um, you know, any comments or questions in the chat area would be great, as well as uh, in the Q&A. Uh, this uh, scenario or this um, simulation is a um, for bank managers uh, with a focus on how to um, introduce people, how to introduce yourself, how to start conversations um, for business networking. So these are folks who do not go out to um, these types of meetings all the time. They might be you know, once a month or so. Um, it's for new employees and new bank officers as well as experienced bank officers as a kind of almost sort of yearly kind of certification um, as a way of um, making sure that the bank is being represented properly and, and people are following proper meeting etiquette um, from the standpoint of representing the bank, but also reaping the benefits of networking at those, um, at those events. So in this example here, uh, and I only have four or five screens of, of this, again, um, the, uh, the uh, I'm just getting, actually getting uh, lost in the chat there. I switched my, my screen layout and the chat kind of rolled back on me there. But um, the, uh, and Kathy, I see your question and I'll, I'll come back to that. The, um, uh, only have four or five screens, again, not able to get into the, the depth uh, of example here, but hopefully those four or five screens will give you an overview of kind of just the different approach that's being taken here. So this is an example of one of the introductory uh, simulations or scenarios within this uh, larger simulation. Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, per my definition, this may be more of a serious game because you're not playing the role of yourself in this. There is a character or characters that you're observing and, and making decisions for. Uh, again, those categorizations are not concrete. Uh, just to, they're, they're there just to give us some perspective on um, the options that are available to us. So in this case, uh, there's an introduction, introduction being made. Uh, there's a few screens of conversation like that. And then you're presented with a decision. Um, you know, what would you do if you were introducing um, this other person? You know, which of these is a, is a better introduction? Uh, so it's within the context of introducing someone at a business meeting and uh, you having to make a decision about the best way to, to make that introduction. When we talk about that concept of problem-based um, experiences with information as a guide, uh, this is an example of, of that in that the information around how to do proper introductions, introducing others, um, you know, business card etiquette 
is contained in this learning solution, but it really is supplementary and it's supportive. So if you have a question at any time about you know the best way to introduce, you can go in and reference this material. You'll also see there's a, a essentially a job aid that can be printed that kind of gives tips and hints about all of this. So traditionally, um, what you're seeing here would be the primary piece or the primary elements of the training, and uh, learners would page through this material and be asked a question about whether they remembered the concepts and the definitions versus actually having to make decisions within a, a scenario. Uh, you'll also see here that um, the learner can skip around to a variety of different scenarios in this, uh, in this example as a way of reference or uh, as a way of just, you know, deciding that, you know, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to check out some of these other more advanced ones um, versus you know going from simple to uh, to more advanced uh, in a linear fashion. The next example I want to show here uh, quickly is uh, information literacy. And uh, as I said, I don't have a, a real in-depth um, demo of this, but the, you can find this out on our website. But you can see the screen capture here, and I'll actually enlarge this a little bit. I think folks got the idea of how to enlarge their screen, but I'll enlarge this for everyone as well. Uh, so this is a serious game um, with the goal of helping college students improve uh, their information literacy skills in a variety of uh, contexts. And this is something that is a, um, a continuation of more conceptual or um, rote learning that they've done previously in some of their classes or in presentations uh, by the librarian. And in this case, they're playing the role of a detective in this, in this serious game. And so you can see they're given cases to investigate, and then they actually have to go to that location and find the um, different piece, pieces of evidence in that location that uh, are um, evidence for the violation of um, the information literacy skills. In this case, um, they are focusing on um, bias and authority as part of um, information, evaluating information as part of information literacy. So those are all the examples that we have time today to, uh, to go through. Again, I'm going to give you, I have lots more, and I'm going to give you some links out to other resources that have a lot more. So regardless, again, of what you call it or what form it takes, how do you categorize it, I'd like to get an idea after looking at some of the categories and just a brief overview of some of the examples here where you see some opportunities for incorporating games as learning solutions in, in your organization. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll reflect back and look back here on some of the questions. So um, one, of the, can, uh, one of the questions from Lauren, can part of the branching go to less challenging, more challenging scenario mid-game? Uh, in the example I was showing, we didn't do that. But yeah, you could certainly do that. And that would provide some individualized learning, some variability in the game uh, or simulation that would certainly um, allow it to be a custom experience for each learner. Uh, the more of that that you build on, the more time it takes, you know, the more costly it can be. But it doesn't have to be exorbitant additional costs. It's just a matter of, like anything else, um, unless it's a, a smorgasbord, um, the more you add on, the more it's going to cost, uh, cost you, uh, even if that cost is time. The recommended time of an entire simulation. Uh, Kathy, that's a really good question. I mean, there's simulations that last you know, days um, or, or weeks. So it really depends on what your, your goal is. Uh, I would say, you know, that obviously needs to be balanced within the context of the learners getting their work done. And obviously longer simulations, I would recommend a, a longer time frame in which people are interacting with those in kind of intermittent uh, types of experiences. So, you know, like anything else, you probably wouldn't want someone to sit down and have to do something for more than 
you know, 30, 45 minutes um, perhaps, and if they're, you know, highly engaged and, you, and really immersed, which is the goal of all of this, you know, you might want to allow them some more time um, to, to get engaged uh, or, you know, to continue that, but you also need to do that within the context of them completing their jobs. Uh, Julie, I, I don't, I can provide some links to what I've done. Others are, are kind of kind of proprietary. Again, with our customers, we're academics, so they know we're going to kind of show um, screenshots of examples, and I've, I've taken out all the logos and everything like that. But uh, there will be links out to a lot of um, immersive learning game simulation examples that you can take a look at, though, even if they're not the ones that I showed today. And Dave, Debbie, yeah, you could definitely embed this as kind of a performance support. And so I'm just looking through here, employee orientation, certification, um, reinforced content, leadership training. Uh, Keith, an example of reinforcing content, and, and I would encourage you to think about this differently and kind of flip, flip that. Um, what the legal issues um, training that uh, was one of the, the options uh, of a demo that we didn't get to uh, was something that actually was done as a pre-class um, simulation. So normally um, the, the new managers would take two days, or I think it was six hours, but it was two separate classroom sessions. One was on the, the facts of um, the legal issues, and then the other was on kind of not scenarios and not even role playing, but it was just a little bit more depth of, you know, just these are things to be aware of. So what we did is actually we, we flipped that and um, did the simulation as a pre-course. So we eliminated three hours of the in-class time. They obviously had the time to do the simulation. Uh, and then they came into the class session with questions and referenced the actual simulations they were doing in the um, you know, in the online simulation and the characters and the, 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 you know, specific instances. And so they were much more engaged in receiving that content um, in the classroom once they had some context around it and some idea of why they needed to know that content. Um, content was obviously a part of reinforcing and supplementary to the simulation and the decisions they were making in the simulation. But again, we kind of started with that simulation. And I'm just looking down through some of the other options here. And these are all, you know, these are all um, good ideas for implementations. And there's a variety of examples out there probably for, for almost every one of those. And Carol, I think, um, you know, compliance issues are, are really interesting. And, and again, legal issues was one of the simulations that we did. Uh, and compliance issues are often treated as a checkbox training. You know, give the people the information, have them complete the assessment. They got a 90%. They learned it. They know how to comply. Well, often that compliance is dependent on them making decisions and, you know, um, making tough decisions in a, in a live environment. So, you know, versus compliance being a checkbox, compliance is probably the most um, ripe area for you know, for simulation, especially if you're talking about, you know, potential loss of life or potential fines or potential product recalls or, you know, whatever the case may be. So that's that's a really great, uh, great example as well as all, as all the others here. All right. So thank you guys for participating there. So a um, little behind here, so I'm going to, and, and um, not a problem, uh, we've had some great comments and conversation and some great questions, and there's still a few that I probably need to get to here. Um, but I do want to move on and talk about some considerations as you begin to move into uh, game-based training. So one of the things to consider is your instructional design approach and process. So some things that are going to need to change are your analysis in instructional design. You're no longer trying to find information. You're trying to find problems, problems that can become part of a simulation or serious game or immersive learning. Uh, your course structure is also going to be a little bit different. You aren't going to be necessarily uh, looking at organizing things in modules as much as you are going to be organizing them in problems and problems that are getting progressively harder. And with any one problem might be three or four modules or three or four topics that you might have contained, you might have broken apart separately previously as individual modules. Um, 
Assessment is another consideration in your instructional design as you move to this uh, this type of approach, uh, considering that the um, what they're what the learner is doing is really an assessment because you're asking them questions throughout the entire thing. So, you know, do you really need to give them a fact-based assessment after they've gone through this problem-based um, learning experience and um, passed or achieved all the goals in that learning experience? So the training itself could be considered an assessment, and that's something you're going to have to consider um, in a variety of different ways and, and levels. Uh, you're also going to have to think about game design. You know, one of the challenges with um, serious games, especially at the very uh, beginning, was that they were either too much learning or too much fun. It's really about finding that balance of something that people are going to improve their performance after having experience, but they're also going to have fun with, and they're going to get immersed in. And that's the whole um, benefit of using these types of approaches is the fact that people get engaged and they're learning something at the same time. Here we are with the technology. And I, you know, the first question I get is, what do you use to develop these? Or how do you, you know, can you do this with storyline? Can you do this with, um, you know, other things? You, you can do this with PowerPoint. One of the examples I have, the lab safety um, classroom simulation was done in PowerPoint. And um, so the technology has an impact. I mean, you have to know how to use the technology, but it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't really matter, and it, of course, does as well. But I guess the main point there is don't start with the technology. Start with the design, and then make adjustments in your design based on what you can do in the, uh, with the technology. And then a big consideration is your organization, your culture. Are you ready? for this type of learning? Will the culture accept a change to you know, problem-based or challenge-based or experiential learning with immersive learning, games, simulations? Um, how will you change learner-manager expectations and prepare them for a different approach? Um, you know, you, we have conditioned the learners to log into an e-learning and click the next button 30 times until they get to the test that a third grader could pass and then consider the training complete. Now, that was tongue-in-cheek and very generalized, but there's a lot of training out there like that. And how are they going to react when you actually need them to spend that whole hour on the training, not just the 10 minutes that they normally, uh, they normally spend just to check it off the list? Uh, again, how is assessment currently viewed in your organization, and how uh, will a problem-based or immersive learning-based approach alter or challenge that current state? Uh, is your LMS prepared to track and report on problem-based learning? or immersive learning. Uh, and then how can your learning team adapt to this different type of approach and what new skills will they need to develop? So um, this organizational change piece is probably you know, the, most, uh, the most impactful and, and one of the biggest things to consider. Uh, so before we move on, uh, definitely would love to hear some comments and questions about any of the considerations. And I'm also going to look back through the, uh, through the chat. Uh, Steve, any sense uh, for design development ratios for these different types of games? Um, you know, I'll give the, the, the standard consultant response to that. It depends. But oftentimes, for the things we've done, we spend more time in design than we do in, in development. And I would say, at the very least, a 2 to 1, if not a 3 to 1 ratio in, in design and development. And if you do, like, any good... Um, you know, any good instructional design or development project, if you do your work in design and Looks like we lost Andy for a brief moment, folks. We'll uh, have him back in one moment. Just uh, hang tight, please. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened to me there, but I am back, so thank you. And I've gotten a little lost in uh, answering questions and kind of lost track of time here, so let's move on. Um, again, not a whole lot of time to talk about gamification. Um, you know, what we re reviewed and discussed is uh, what a lot of people are referring to as gamification. However, the intent of the term um, uh, that um, of, the, of the term gamification was to describe the use of game mechanics and non-game experiences. So instead of training, again, think motivation tactics and something more similar to performance support. 
Um, the same elements that we introduce when talking about games in simulation are also an important part of gamification. They are just applied in, in different ways. Uh, today's webinar focus was more on games and simulations for training. Uh, we could do an entirely separate session on gamification for training, education, and workplace for performance. Uh, there are a lot of great examples out there, and more and more successes are being realized all the time. Um, again, I'll share some resources for further exploration of gamification uh, on another screen as we conclude the webinar. So um, we're just hitting our, our webinar time here now. We've had a lot of questions and conversations throughout, and I give you guys uh, thank you guys for that. Um, but I certainly will take any other questions here as we wrap up as well. And then I'll leave my contact information on the screen. Um, again, we have some resources to share, and would also like to get your feedback on this section, uh, on this session, as well as other topics and sessions that you would like to uh, like to uh, to hear about and be involved with. And some of the questions that I don't get to as well um, will be addressed, and there'll be some follow up in an article that uh, I'll be writing for Training Pros, and they'll be uh, they'll be distributing. All right, thank you guys so much. And uh, just want to share the resources on the left side of the screen here and also uh, thank Training Pros again for uh, hosting and kind of um, putting this all together for us. And we're really excited about the partnership and looking forward to the, um, um, you know, looking forward to the uh, future series and other sessions that we have coming up. And I'll actually share information on one of those uh, in a moment or two. I uh, just want to share a little bit more information about Training Pros. And our next webinar is October 27th at 3 p.m. and we're going to focus on social learning in that uh, in that session. And Thank also want to share some... Me. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Just sharing some more information about uh, Harrisburg University. Go ahead, Steve. I just wanted to thank you and your team for working with us to pull, put this together, and we're really looking forward to uh, an ongoing partnership to provide this, these type of learning opportunities to the learning and development community uh, going forward, too. So I want to thank everybody for attending and for, again, your efforts. All right. Thanks, Steve. And I'm going to switch to the feedback screen, and uh, the session will end from there. And when you're entering your feedback, uh, you do not have to submit anything. Uh, you just uh, make a selection and it will register and you can change your selection um, at, at any time as well. And, and thanks again, everyone. Uh, the resources and the chat are still active at the bottom of the screen. And there's also an option here for uh, letting us know what other topics you're interested in, in learning about. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve. And uh, have a great day.